the Word of God and study His wonderful book together with me, please. And I hope I'm not coming out too loud to you guys. Am I? Everything okay? Just good. All right. We're going to Acts chapter number 17, first of all, and then into chapter number 18. And I want to look at a few things there that I trust will be important. And remember, I said last week that my goal was to get into 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2 uh, tonight. So I intend to do just that. But it's not going to be right away. Got a couple of other things I need to clear up first. Uh, the problem is, you see, I, I go back and I review these materials and I think to myself, well, I've got to bring this out. I can't leave that out, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so that's what's going on tonight. In chapter number 17, we went with the Apostle Paul to Mars Hill and that great Athenian address that he made. What a tremendous piece of oratory it is. I came down to the end of it, and it's just about like it is today. Some mocked. Others said, we will hear thee again of this matter, in verse number 32. So Paul departed from among them. After all, that's all you can do. Give the message, and then go on. But verse 34 says, how be it certain men clave unto him. Obviously, that means they converted. Obviously, that means they saw, may I say, the light and came to Jesus Christ. Why else would they have stayed with the Apostle Paul? What was their common bond? Why is it that they wanted to be with Paul? I say it is because he knew the Lord. He represented fellowship in Jesus Christ our Savior. And that's why they wanted to cleave together. And I believe it's kind of true in our day, folk, when people really know the Lord as their Savior. I want to be careful here, but boy, it seems to me like you, you do want to be around others that know the Lord. You do want to be in church. It's kind of like I heard a lady say one time in Houston that she wanted to go to church. She loved the Lord, and she was glad to be in church. It wasn't a drudgery to her. It was a blessing to her to be there. And i got to tell you, the way it is with me, of course, you know me, I grew up in a minister's home. I've been in church all of my life, but I really don't know what I'd do with my week if it weren't for church. I kind of gear everything and judge everything by going to church on Sunday and on Wednesday night, too, in case you're interested. I've done it for so long that if I have to miss, and I have had to miss a couple of times uh, since I've been a minister, when I miss, it's like it, it gets everything out of sync. Nothing's right. I'll never forget, uh, I have missed one Sunday here because of being sick, and I missed one Sunday in Houston because of being sick. At that time in Houston, I told the doctor if he'd let me go home from the hospital, I'd be good. I'd stay in bed. I wouldn't go and preach that next day. The assistant would. I, I would stay there. And so they let me out of the hospital. Man, I, I had a trip planned to Colorado. And I could see that trip going out the window if I had to go into the hospital. So I, I convinced him, and he let me go home. But I remember, I even had... TV on and watch church services, some very good church services on TV, but it's not like being in church. It's not like being there with other people of like mind. It's not like being there and in fellowship together because our fellowship is first of all with the Lord and that is biblical. Why did they cleave unto the Apostle Paul? I believe it was because they were of one spirit, of one mind. They talked the same way. They had the same lingo, as it were. And among those were this Dionysus, Dionysus, if you care uh, to pronounce that way, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, if I may so pronounce it that way, and others with them. And then in chapter number 18, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. And I... From that, want to look to the book of 1 Corinthians, but not 
just yet. Don't turn to 1 Corinthians just yet. I've got a couple other things to look at first. You may remember that I told you last week that many commentators think that 1st and 2nd Thessalonians was written either from Athens or from Corinth at this particular time. Now it is good for us to remember, please, that Paul had gone to Thessalonica and in Thessalonica he had had some problems. In fact, you'll remember, please, that in verse number 11 after he left Thessalonica, and I'm in Acts chapter 17 now. In verse number 11, look what the Bible says. The Bereans, these, he left Thessalonica and went to Berea. Do you remember when we were there? Okay, now, these, that is the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And consequently, we know that Paul, having gone to Thessalonica in Acts chapter number 17, verse number 1. And there was trouble there. There was trial there. And so he went from there down to Berea. And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. However, there were people in Thessalonica that did get saved and did come to Jesus Christ as their Savior. Isn't that wonderful? And instead of focusing on the troubles and the trials that they may have had, how about focusing on the people that got saved and the people that did grow in the Lord and the people that did come together in fellowship and the church that was born in Thessalonica. And there was a church born in Thessalonica. And now we have the Apostle Paul going into Berea, on into Athens, and then he is going into Corinth. And it is thought that it was either at Corinth or Athens that the Holy Spirit of God inspired Paul to pen the books of First and Second Thessalonians. It's kind of an important thing to look at those two books in this perspective because both of those books have a great deal of doctrine in them specifically and especially about the second coming of Jesus Christ our Lord. So I cannot just pass over these writings. It's about this time that the Apostle Paul is writing concerning the Deliverer concerning the deliverance, not just from hell and salvation, but deliverance from this world and going to heaven. For instance, in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, I would like to begin my reading in verse number 13. You'll readily recognize these verses of Scripture. The Apostle Paul says, and obviously we believe here tonight this is under divine inspiration. In other words, these aren't the words of Paul. They're the words of God Almighty. Here's what it says. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Quite often in the Bible, those who die in Christ, those who are saved and die, are said to be asleep. Now, no, that does not mean there is soul sleep, that they're going to come awake at the rapture. What it means is their body is, so to speak, asleep, but their soul is with heaven, or with Christ in heaven. And he does not want the brethren to be ignorant of these things. Why? That ye sorrow not that ye sorrow not. You've heard the phraseology many times. When we have a loved one die or go on to be with the Lord, we sorrow, but not as those who have no hope. That makes all the difference in the world. You see, I've lost a dad in my lifetime and when I was quite young, just in the eighth grade in school. But even then, Dad left me with a heritage of the Bible and the Word of God. And even back then, I had the hope of being reunited with Dad one of these days. 
My mother is gone on now. I have a couple of brothers there. I have a couple of siblings there whom I never met. And I'm thankful that I have a hope of one day being there and being reunited with my loved ones. But my hope goes far beyond that, for Jesus Christ is my hope. All of my hopes, both now and forever, are resting in Jesus Christ. Not in a politician, not in an election, not in something new on this earth, but in Jesus Christ, my Lord. And so the Apostle Paul is telling these Thessalonians that, remember now, he has not been from Thessalonica a very long time, but he is writing back to them that ye sorrow not. And apparently, Paul had heard that there had been some sorrow there. And so he says that ye sorrow not. Then he goes on to say, uh, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I love the next phrase, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, verse 18 says, comfort one another with these words. It's just kind of interesting to me that Paul had not been gone from Thessalonica for a very long time before I consider it to be as the commentators say. We have here his writing back to them that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with what words? The coming of Jesus Christ our Lord. And the same comfort and the same hope is still with us today. I hope for the second coming of Jesus Christ. I long for the second coming of Jesus Christ. I believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. He is coming again. One way I know He is coming again is because 2 Peter chapter number 3 tells us that in the last days scoffers shall come saying, Where is the promise of His coming? Know this also, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But verse 10 of 2 Peter chapter number 3 says, But the day of the Lord will come. Wherefore, we have the same comfort today as they had, what, 2,000 years ago now, back in Thessalonica. We have the same hope today that they, what, they had, well, in Athens and Corinth from whence Paul was penning these words. We have the same comfort today. Why? Because we have the same comforter today. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And listen, folks, you can count on the Lord. I, I, this will come as a real shocker to you, I know. But uh, now, I don't want to destroy anybody's uh, joy in the coming election or anything. But I want to say this. Uh, these politicians, you can't always trust them. Maybe I should have put at these politicians, you can't ever trust them. That, that might be. I, I don't know. Uh, some are a lot better than others, though. I want to say that, and I hope you'll take Billy Graham's advice and vote for biblical principles, at least to the best of your ability. I know how some guys play that fiddle before elections and then after elections, whatever. 
but still I'm going to do the best I can. Um, I already have voted, in case you're interested. I'm not running away so I don't have to vote on November 6th. Uh, when you get to a, a certain maturity, notice I said maturity, not old age. Uh, when you get to a certain degree of maturity, they'll send you a ballot through the mail. And you can vote through the mail. You don't have to stand in line. Uh, there are advantages to maturity. <laughs> anyway. You can't trust the politicians, but brothers and sisters, you can trust Jesus Christ. Amen. Let every man be a liar, but let God be true. And God is true. And he will fulfill his word. And the Bible, I love the way the Bible puts stuff. God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But as long-suffering to us word not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. There it is. But the day of the Lord will come. Amen. That's what it says. The day of the Lord will come. Uh, of course, there's a thief in the night and so on and so forth. But that leads me to go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 now. Please, this is doctrinally sound and we need to get it into our heads and into our hearts. In chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, after talking about what I believe to be the rapture. Am I not fair in speaking of the rapture? And that, I mean, is that not the rapture? There can be no doubt about it. In chapter number 5 then, he says this. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. That's kind of interesting language, isn't it? You want me to give you a commentary on what that means? It means God has given us signs in his word that point to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, right? Amen. You know perfectly well he cometh as a thief in the night. No man knoweth the day nor the hour. But I submit for your consideration, obviously, God does not want us to be in the dark on this thing. God wants us to be able to perceive some things and not be deceived and be ready when the Lord comes. He has given various signs throughout the whole Bible about his second coming. Read the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. Brothers and sisters, it's pretty well spelled out. And I want to say this, you put that together with the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel and the book of Isaiah, and it looks to me like the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. It looks to me like we're on the very threshold of this thing. I want to say this, I do believe something's going to happen big one way or the other before very long. We're not going to continue like we are forever. Do you guys realize that budgets have gone from uh, under $200 billion a year in the hole to some people say, well, over an extra trillion dollars a year. No, last four years, trillion dollars. We can't sustain that forever. Someday the bill is going to come due. Now I want to say this, something's going to happen one way or the other. I really believe it's going to be the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now let me say this. Sometimes when I use this kind of language that something's going to happen one way or the other, I've had people get somewhat frightened and scared. You need not be frightened unless you're not living for the Lord.
You need not be frightened unless you're not saved. The Lord has always taken care of his own, and he always will. I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying, yeah, Brother Burkholder, what about Tyndall? And what about uh, some of those people that died at the stake and were burned at the stake and so on and so forth? Let me tell you something. You read the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11, the great faith chapter of the Bible, and you're going to read over and over and over about the great exploits those heroes of the faith did through faith. But you're going to get to the point where it says two important little words, and others. Do you remember those two words in Hebrews 11? And then it lists those who were sawn asunder, literally pulled apart, martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ, not accepting deliverance, for they had a better hope in Christ, let me say this. God gives grace to bear whatever comes along at the time. I'm not sure God gives grace ahead of time. But he gives grace where grace is needed and when it is needed. And that's Hebrews chapter number 4. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, I cannot say exactly how it's going to happen or what's going to happen or when it's going to happen, but I can say this, Jesus is coming again. Are you ready? He doesn't want you to be in darkness as that day should overtake you as a thief. That's what it says. In the book, Clear as a Bell, it's all there. Now, some of the Thessalonians seem to get the idea, and I'm going to have to switch to another Bible now that's got that page in it. If you turn to 2 Thessalonians with me, just a moment or two, and then we're going to 1 Corinthians tonight, because I said we were, and I'm going there, if it's the last thing I do. After talking about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, and the first part of chapter number 5, he goes on to address what apparently became an error at Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians. He wrote them a second book to try to correct an error. And apparently, some of them had thought the rapture had occurred already. Uh, that is kind of a deduction made by many theologians, those who careful, carefully study the Bible, and I too agree with them on this, and so he's going to write them some signs that are going to take place before the, the time of the literal second coming of Christ to earth takes place. No, the day of the Lord hasn't come yet. You didn't miss it. I know you're going through some problems, but I want to tell you what really is going to happen before Jesus comes. So let's look in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. I'd like for you to please consider that that phrase, our gathering together unto him, is none other than the rapture. Well, what else is it going to be? Our gathering together unto him? I mean, we're gathered here tonight in his name, are we not? But there's something greater being talked about here. Our gathering together unto him. Man, brothers and sisters, he's talking about our being snatched out of here. Some people will say, well, the word rapture is never found in the Bible. No, but the truth is. And for want of better phraseology, mankind has reduced the whole body of truth to one word, the rapture. And I submit this gathering together unto him is the rapture. And in case you're interested, that word does mean gathering together. The rapture. That's how it's described in the Bible. And this is the gathering together unto him. Now, we not only have the rapture of joy that's going to be there. There's no doubt about that. I don't know about you, anybody, uh, anyway, but he can't come too soon for me. 
You talk about a rapturous joy, that's going to be a rapture, no doubt about it. But this rapture is the rapture where we're taken out of here. In a, uh, for, 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to 1 Corinthians tonight, no matter what. Uh, I don't care if we're here till midnight, we're going to 1 Corinthians tonight. But uh, I want to say this, uh, in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be gathered unto him. I'm talking about going to heaven to be with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Meeting him in the air and his taking us on from there. We're going to be escorted into the kingdom of God. Not by the angels, not by Peter. Sometimes they say Peter's coming to get us. I'll use that language kind of loosely. No, sir. We're not going to be escorted by Michael, the archangel, archangel, nor Gabriel, another of the archangels. We're going to be escorted by Jesus Christ himself right into the pearly gates. By our gathering together unto him. Are you ready for the rapture? Now he says, brethren, I'm writing you this. I want you to keep in mind as a backdrop, the rapture's coming up ahead. And I'm writing these things in verse number two now. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Uh, they had thought that, you know, they're going through various troubles and trials and so on. Uh, they're thinking, man, we're already in the tribulation period. This thing has already come about here. And he says, now I'm writing you. I want you to keep in mind the joy of the rapture. I want you to keep in mind the future. I want you to keep in mind the hope that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, but I don't want you to be shaken in your mind as though it's already happened. And we made a mistake on this thing. He said, I'm going to give you these words so you can tell us a little bit better about some things. Let's go further, please. Let no man deceive you by any means. That's a good warning. Because there are plenty of deceivers out there. You all have been able to cite the different businesses of guys hiding in caves, getting rid of all that they've got and waiting for the return of the Lord. God doesn't want us to find a hideout to hide in till he comes. He wants us to get out and propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Until he comes. Now looky here. He says. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come. Except there come a falling away first. And contrary to what some theologians believe. I believe that falling away. Is indeed a backsliding. And a going away from the things of Christ. The backsliding of the true church. And a going away from the things of Christ by the professing church and the apostate world. And we're seeing that in this day we live in. I believe we're in the time of the falling away. I know ministers before me have said that. Well, if they said it back then, look how much more it is now. We are retrogressing at a horrific rate in this world that we're in, folks. I, 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 I can't imagine in just the last 10 years. Think of the last 10 years the way the world has gone. The way our country has gone. Think of the last five years the way our country has gone. The last two years the way it's gone and so on. And so he says, let no man deceive you. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. And that's none other than what we refer to as the Antichrist. You can see Daniel chapter number 9 for further references. You can see the entire book of Daniel for further references on the Antichrist. I'm just saying tonight that that is indeed the Antichrist. In other words, the Lord is not going to come and set up his kingdom. There's not going to be a rapture until the falling away. And then that man of sin is going to be revealed, the son of perdition. I believe he's going to be revealed after the rapture, in case you're interested. I think that can be shown from Daniel's 70th week, and I think that's logical by the other scriptures in the Bible. Paul is using this to show the people, listen, the Lord's not going to come until there's a falling away first. And then there's going to be a seven-year tribulation period 
during that seven year tribulation period, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, is going to be revealed. And here's what the Bible says about him. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. It's always been the devil's design to usurp the throne of God Almighty, right? I mean, for, that's what got him booted out of heaven in the first place. He's going to be like God. I'll put my, my throne up above God's throne. Is that, no, you won't. Our God is omnipotent, all-powerful. He created the devil. The devil didn't create God. God's always been and always will be. Read the book of Revelation, chapter number 1. I am he which is and which was and which will be forevermore, according to the book of Revelation, chapter number 1. And here we have this Antichrist, though, still taking a stab at it. Still wanting to do his age-long plan against God Almighty. It'll never be. Showing himself that he is God. Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. In other words, something is hindering the revelation of the Antichrist. Something is hindering the full revelation of the degradation of the tribulation period. Verse number 7 says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already now work. Oh boy, that's for sure the truth. Only he who now letteth or hindereth will let or will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And that you can know that word let means hinder is because Paul said he wanted to go see uh, uh, the Romans in Rome, but he was let hitherto. What does it mean? He was hindered. He didn't get the chance to do it. And likewise, the same word is used here. You know what? There is something hindering the revelation of the Antichrist. There is something hindering the full degradation pictured in the Bible as of the tribulation period. But the Bible says, He will continue to hinder, if I may put it in these words, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. In other words, there's something hindering sin at this point in time. Did you know that? There is something that is hindering the revelation of the Antichrist. There is, is the hinderer. Who is the hinderer? I suggest it's the Holy Spirit of God indwelling Christian believers. And uh, if you want my opinion... Uh, I believe that when the rapture comes and all of the Christians in whom the Holy Spirit is indwelling and thus hindering the free onslaught of sin in this world, they're going to be taken out of here and then this world is going to see sin and all of its gory head stick itself straight up. Our world does not understand what it's going to be like when the hinderer is removed. And Satan has, I'll use the word full reign, he won't have full reign, God's still going to be in control. I, I want to tell you something, folks. A lot of these people that get mad at God and don't want God uh, hindering their lustful pursuit of pleasure in this world. They're going to find out what it's like when the Holy Spirit of God is removed out of here. Now, again, I know the Holy Spirit of God is uh, God the Holy Spirit and therefore omnipresent. I know he, He's still going to be around, but He's not going to be in that unique work. Now, I ask you to bear me witness on this. In the church age that we live in right now, is it not right, is it not fair to say the Holy Spirit of God has a unique work of indwelling believers. I mean, Jesus used the phraseology, he'd go away and send the comforter. What, no, you're not, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God, and you're not your own, you're bought with a price. 
Now, when the believers are raptured out of here and the Holy Spirit's indwelling, restraining power is taken out of here, then the world's going to find out what sin's all about. You read the rest of Thessalonians chapter number 2 and you'll see that all of those who had the proper chance, the proper chance being however God defines the proper chance to get saved before the rapture will not get saved during the tribulation period. I do believe there will be people saved in the tribulation period, but it won't be those who had what God considers to have been ample opportunity to get saved before the rapture. Look at the, it says, I'll send them a strong delusion that they'll believe the lie of the Antichrist. That's why it's so serious, folks. When the Holy Spirit of God convicts the heart to get saved, man, that's time to get saved. With that, I said I was going to 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to 1 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul went to Corinth after Athens. And at Athens, he made one of the most beautiful speeches, one of the most stirring speeches that they say has ever been given. As I have been told, Paul's Athenian address is engraved in stone. You've been there, Brother Lee. You've probably seen it in Koine, Greek Koine. His Athenian address is engraved in stone over there. And I was talking to others about statues of Paul and so on in different uh, situations there. Well, Paul went to Corinth after Athens. Corinth was the next stop on his second missionary journey. Went to Corinth. And it is interesting that, I mean, guys, you talk about a message that was a message among messages. It was Paul's Athenian address, right? Right? It's stirring. It's beautiful. It has great themes to it. But when he went to Corinth, Paul changed. And the best way I know to describe it, I need more time. I realize I'm already over time. That's nothing new you're saying, I know. But in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, Here's what he says about coming to Corinth. And I, brethren, when I came to you, there it is, when I came to you, where did he come from? Athens. And I, brethren, when I came to you, excuse me, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Now keep in mind, this is right after that tremendous Athenian address. And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Verse 2 is pivotal. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And then he gave a reason that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now to me, that is profound. And to me, that gives hope to the likes of us. I don't know about you guys, but I'll never come up with an Athenian address like the Apostle Paul did. Now, he was inspired of God, and keep that in mind. But give Paul credit, he was very well educated. He, he was a very good speaker. He knew how to make a delivery. Paul knew how to work a crowd. Is that a safe way of putting it? There are a lot of guys like that in the day that we live in. But Paul refused to do it. He said, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech, nor of wisdom. I'm not there after the rudiments of this world. I'm not there after the 
ideas of what the speech classes have taught me down at Gamaliel's University or anything else. I was with you in weakness and in fear. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified, that your faith should not stand in the power of man, but in the power of God. Ultimately, brothers and sisters, it's got to be the power of God. I fear too many Christians are standing in the power of man in this day that we live in. I fear too many Christians are following a man this or that way instead of thus saith the Lord. I fear that there's too much activity that is after this world in churches rather than after the Holy Spirit of God. If there's one thing we can pray for tonight in our prayer time, it is this, that there'd be real Holy Ghost, heaven-sent revival come down to the church. We can pray for that. You say, I hadn't got anything to pray about. Well, I, I, I praise the Lord for that in one way, uh, because it means everything must be going pretty good in your life. And Paul wanted the followers of Christ to be in health, spiritual health, as well as physical health. He wanted that. I'm happy for you. But I'll tell you, you do have something to pray about tonight. The church has something to pray about tonight. And that prayer ought to be in the vein of the powerful Holy Spirit of God's coming down to our congregation and so moving that there is powerful conviction where there ought to be powerful conviction. Amen. That there is powerful dedication where there ought to be powerful dedication. Amen. That there is a strong <clears throat> determination to follow Jesus Christ our Lord. There's something to pray about tonight in our prayer time. And I'll close there and take your prayer requests, please, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer.